I was going to Mark chapter 1. We are going to be uh, looking at verses 14 through 20. Uh, this morning we're doing some messages through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Mark's probably the least, uh, almost said the least favorite, uh, the least uh, studied, I would say, of the, pro- of the uh, Gospels, uh, even though it's the, the shortest. Uh, a lot of people will just, uh, because Mark seems to highlight and hit certain things of Jesus' life, uh, a lot of scholars just have, have stayed in John or they've stayed in the Matthew uh, Luke probably is third, and then then Mark, and and even though Mark is the earliest of the ones written, uh, it seems to be the least studied. And so, uh, let's read these verses together, and then I want to talk about the the preaching of Christ this morning and the and the message that he brought. In verse fourteen, it says, "Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel." And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw, John, or I'm sorry, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat that the hired servants with the hired servants and went after him. I told you I could see better with these glasses, and some of you are probably questioning that. I really struggled through that, that text there. The, uh, the first message I ever preached was, uh, I'll never forget it, because I started the message off with something like this. It was the, Bible, the, the message was about the four suppers in the Bible. And I, with this flashy introduction, I stood up to the pulpit and I said, if you go to the first supper, then you won't go to the second supper. But you'll get to go to the third supper, and you won't have to go to the fourth supper. On the other hand, if you don't go to the first supper, then you most assuredly will go to the second supper. You can't go to the third supper, and you might actually be the fourth supper. Now, if that confused you, don't worry, because it confused everybody I was preaching to, too, and I think I totally lost them. And the preacher had given me like 20 minutes to speak. It was one of my first messages in Bible college. He gave me like 20 minutes. And within about seven minutes, I was totally done with all my notes. And I went, now what do I do? Okay, I'm in big trouble. And like any young preacher, I'd heard some guy preach that message, and he was flamboyant. It all made sense when he did it. And then when I tried to preach it, just nothing flowed. And I don't know if all preachers have gotten off to a rough start like I did. I'm supposed, I'm supposed that most of them did. But there was one preacher who always had it all together. And that was, of course, the greatest preacher who ever lived, the person of Jesus Christ. His words were always perfect. Uh, His truth was always perfect. The way that he applied the scriptures was always perfect. The spiritual truths that he taught were the most penetrating in all of history. Uh, I say in your outline there on on uh, on the paper there, it was because of his logos, his ethnos, and his pathos. His words, his ethics... And his passion. When we read about the the uh, preaching of Jesus, the first thing I want you to see this morning is the heart of Jesus's preaching. What was his core message? What was the one thing or the main things that Jesus Christ tried to get across? In verse fourteen, we read it says, "Now after John was put into prison, and we haven't gone very far in this book that we weren't learn immediately that that John the Baptist is cast into prison." Pretty early on. Uh, If you read other passages of Scripture, you'll find out that the reason that John had been cast into prison is because the king at that time was a guy named Herod. And Herod was having an incestuous relationship with his father's wife, the queen Herodias. And he confronted him about it. He preached to him about it. And he told him that this was an improper relationship. And in that day and age, when you offended the king and if you offended the queen, you simply just got cast into prison until they decided what they were going to do with you. And we also know from other scripture that later on, uh, uh, in uh, in, uh, John has uh, uh, even sends a message out to Jesus and gets a message to him. But later on, John the Baptist is going to have his head cut off. Uh, The queen is going to get tired of him. She's going to silence him. And so she has John the Baptist's head cut off and he's killed in prison. He will never get out of this prison. But John, you'll remember, was was the light. He was the, the light bearer, the one who pointed people to Christ. And now that the light bearer, if you will, has been kind of extinguished to a bit and at least you know, hidden and buried in prison, the ministry of Jesus is going to amp up. As the, as the light bearer or the, or the light uh, director is going to be 
kind of squished a little bit, the light is going to shine brighter. And Christ now is going to amp up his preaching. And the Bible tells us that there are th three themes to, to the preaching of Christ. The first is mentioned as the kingdom of God, and then the, the uh, topic of repentance, and then belief. And I'm going to reverse those. And the first one I want to talk about, of course, is, is belief in the gospel. In verse 15, we, we say, Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. In other words, the time has come. The time is now. Someone told me one time that they left the church because the preacher was always telling them that, that, that now was the time to come to Christ. Now was the time to make a decision. Now was the time to get your life straightened out. And the person told me, I said, well, I got tired of hearing that, so I left the church and decided that, in fact, the, his words were, you know, I think everybody just comes to Christ in their own time. And I know what he was saying. He, what he was saying was he didn't like being pressured or felt like the, the pastor was, was pressuring him. But, but the Bible also says, folks, that now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time that we come to Christ. If God is speaking to your heart, God is speaking to you about something that you need to deal with in your life, now is the day to get it settled. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Now is the time. Jesus, when Jesus says the time is fulfilled, He's saying now is the time that Messiah is here. If you're still looking, you can quit looking. Now is the time that Christ has come on the scene. Now is the time to be ready. He said, um, Jesus' message, as I said, consisted of three parts. The first one he says is, is that I'm going to deal with. He says, you need to believe. Jesus is telling the Galileans here that they need to believe in the gospel. Uh, they were to believe that Messiah had come. They were to believe John's message. And the message of salvation has always been, you must believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't believe that, if you don't trust Him as your Savior, there is no salvation. Now, there are many people that believe that, that Christ existed, okay? Uh, you can talk to most college professors. You can talk to most people that uh, are on the streets. You can talk to the people that you work with, and you can say, do you believe in Jesus? And the majority of them will say, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Uh, I believe Jesus lived. I believe He existed. I believe He walked on this earth. In fact, there's enough historical evidence to show that Jesus walked on this earth. But that's not belief in the gospel, okay? And Jesus said you must believe in in the gospel. You say, well, what is the gospel? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, that he was buried and that he died and that he rose again the third day. That, that's the gospel message. And do you believe that? And if you press people on that, well, do you believe that Jesus lived? Do you believe that he died? Do you believe that he actually rose again? And that third point, I'm going to tell you, is going to stop a lot of people. Well, you know, I don't know if he really rose again. I mean, come on. I believe somebody could really raise from the dead. And, and Jesus is saying, that's the gospel. That's what you must believe. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You must believe that Jesus was God, that He was God's Son, that He died on the cross, that He rose from the dead three days later, that He sits on the right hand of the Father in heaven today, that He paid for your sin, and you must trust in His payment for your sin for salvation instead of your own good deeds for salvation. I mean, I can't make it any clearer than that. And to stop on any one of those points or say, well, I'm not so sure about that. I don't know if I really believe that. I don't know if I really buy that then you do not have saving faith. You might have a, a, a head knowledge or, or a head belief in God, but you don't have salvation. Acts 16, 31, Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You know, sadly today, churches don't preach a lot about salvation and what it really means to genuinely be saved. At most churches you can go to for years on end and no one will ever confront you about your salvation. They'll never ask you, well, tell me about the time that you came to Jesus Christ. Tell me that story. Tell me about that. Most churches will never, ever confront you on that. Years ago, I was, when we were in Arkansas and I was pastoring down there, a family came to our church, and they were one of the neatest families. I was really glad that they came. Our boys played ball together, and he was one of the other coaches in the league, or maybe we coached together. And just a really, really neat family. When they told me that they were going to come one Sunday, I was really surprised. and went, wow, this guy's pretty classy and I'm not very classy, and our church wasn't all that classy, but so I thought, when this guy comes, that'd really be neat. And so I was really excited they were coming, and, and they showed up that Sunday, and we probably had lunch with them. We usually did. And, and later on that week, I got a visit with them, and I went out to see them out at the, out their house. And I drove up to this house, and I mean to tell you, 
Hooey, they were way out of our league as far as churches go. Their house was bigger than our church. And, uh, and uh, we drove up there, and, and I went inside, and, they, and we sat down for a while, and we talked for a while. And, and I finally turned to him, and I said, tell me, and, and I, you know, to this day I can't even remember their names, but I said, tell me about uh, when you came to Christ. And he said, well, I can tell you exactly when I came to Christ. And he said, I was like an 8-year-old boy or 9-year-old boy, and, and I walked down that aisle, and I knew I was a sinner, and I knew I needed to trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I gave my life to Christ, and I've been saved ever since. Now I went, that's really neat. And I turned to her. I said, what about you? Tell me when you came to Christ. And she immediately just took out a very serious look on her face and very kind of sat back and said, well, I don't really think that's something we need to share. And she said, I just, I think that's kind of a personal question. And I said, well, it is. It is a very personal question. I'm asking you when you personally came to Jesus Christ, you know. And, uh, and she just, uh, she him hauled around and she said, well, you know, no one has ever asked me that question before. Now, here was a woman who was probably in her 40s and no one had ever asked her when she trusted in Christ as her Savior, including the churches that she had attended, okay. And she said, no one has ever asked me that question before. And uh, she said, uh, you know, but, uh, but I've been in church all my life and which I knew what that means. Uh, you know, I've been in church all my life, and I've even taught Sunday school, and no one's ever asked me if I've trusted in Christ. And I talked, the longer I talked with her, it was pretty evident that she had no, no idea what it meant to actually trust in Christ, repent of her sin, uh, confess that sin to Him. In fact, that she, she eventually, it was pretty clearly that she was offended by the fact that I had even asked. And by the way, they never came back to our church, Okay. And to this day, I don't know if she ever trusted in Christ. In fact, I would most likely guess that they finally found a church where no one was going to confront her on that question and that issue. And, and I would guess today she's probably still never trusted in Christ. And I'm going to tell you, folks, that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who will sit in churches this morning and no one will ever ask them about their personal relationship with Christ and when they trusted in Christ. And at the same time, I've talked with people in Baptist churches uh, and churches just like ours and good churches that will say, well, you know, I don't really ever remember being saved. I've just kind of always been saved. And I'm going to tell you right now, no, you haven't. We don't come into this world already saved. And we don't get it by osmosis from our parents because they threw us in the nursery when we were kids, okay? I was thrown in the nursery when I was a kid. But I'm going to tell you right now, I was a little devil growing up, all right? That didn't make me a Christian. And, uh, and just because our parents drug us to church every Sunday, and I was one of those kids, I was probably on the nursery roll two or three days after I was born. I never missed a Sunday. I was there you know, every time the doors were open. I hear that all the time. My parents drug me to church every time the doors were open. Well, good. Obviously, it didn't do much good. You probably should have been there sometimes when the doors weren't open. Maybe you'd have gotten a little bit more out of it. But, you know, I was always there. So I must really be this good person. And being good is great. But it doesn't bring salvation. It is not belief in the gospel. And if this church doesn't stand on anything else, folks, we must always stand on that. We can't be confused about that. That is the thing that has made us all part of the family of Christ. It's what our unity is totally built around. And I'm truly convinced that there are many, many people in our churches today who have played the game well. They've gone to church since they were kids. Maybe even their parents worked in the church. They taught, they've taught Sunday school. They grew up in the youth group. They married somebody from the church. They got their Sunday school awards. awards. They were there, as we said, every time the doors were open. Uh, they know most of the books in the Bible. They even know most of the Christian words like fellowship and brother and born again. And they do some good deeds down at the church, but they've never made a commitment to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I'm convinced of that. I asked Dr. Uh, uh, oh my goodness, R.L. Heimers was his name, pastored a very large church in the Los Angeles area. Southern California was kind of interesting because uh, uh, as big as the Los Angeles metro area is, okay, no one ever wanted to start a church in the city of Los Angeles. We had churches in Glendora, and we had churches in Newhall, and we had churches in Ventura, and we had churches in Thousand Oaks, and we had churches in Riverside, and we had churches in El Cajon, and we had churches in Escondido, and we had churches everywhere there was. But who wanted to go to Los Angeles, actually the city? And for the longest time, our fellowship, Baptist Bible Fellowship of Churches, had no church in Los Angeles. And a guy by the name of R.L. Heimers, who was, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, a very odd gentleman, decided, I'm going to Los Angeles to start a church. And he and his Korean wife and their seven or eight, nine kids went to L.A. and started a church. And his church grew, and people came to Christ. And, and because his church grew and people came to Christ, they started letting him speak at different conferences and, and some of our preachers' meetings and things like that. 
And Dr. R. L. Heimers, was his name, would preach. And I remember one time having lunch with him after one of these particular meetings, and uh, one of the men across the table asked him, I said, Dr. Heimers, how many people in your church do you, you know, you've grown so fast, you know, and are people really getting it? Are they really understanding the gospel of Christ? Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, are they really getting the whole gist of it? And Dr. Heimer said this, and it really surprised me. He said, he said, personally, he said, I believe that 80% of the people in our Baptist churches are probably lost and dying and on their way to hell. Now let that sink in for a second. I don't know if that blows you away like it blows me away. But he said 80% of the people, and he went on to say about 80% of our people in our churches have gone to church their whole life as kids. They've always been in church. They went through the youth group. Some of them went to Bible college. They've done all the right things. They've done everything their moms and dads told them. But there's never been a commitment, a time when they said, I believe in this Jesus with my life. Apart from the church, apart from the youth group, apart from the invitation, apart from the music, apart from the band, apart from the choir, apart from everything else, I put my trust, I make a decision. If I'm the only person on the face of this earth, I'm going to choose in Christ. You see, that's the difference right there. If you were the only person on the face of this earth, would you still believe that Jesus came and died for your sin? Most of us go, well, I don't know. Nobody ever taught me that. I don't know if I'd, you know, I'd you know. It really it almost comes down to that. If you were the only one, if everybody else died out in a world catastrophe tomorrow, would your faith still in Christ be there? Would you still stand for Him? Would you still have a testimony for Him? Would you still live right? Would you still live ethical? That's a belief in the gospel of Christ. It's a belief that changes lives. And that's really Jesus' second point here, and that's repentance. Jesus also re- preached repentance. Without getting into a long definition of what repentance is, repentance is basically a belief that changes your life. That's what it is. It's a belief that changes your life. It's pretty simple. If there are no substantial changes in your life, then you should probably question whether or not you have truly been saved. Uh, you ought to look at your life. You say, well, Brother Jeff, I, there weren't too many drastic changes to make because I was a pretty good kid. Mom and Dad drug us to church. We had to sit on the front row. We had to listen to the preacher. We had to take notes. We had to do all these things. You know. So maybe you, you weren't, uh, you know, maybe you weren't dealing drugs at six years old. Okay? And maybe you didn't get out of prison when you were 12. Okay? And maybe you weren't beating up the other kids in the playground when you were 13. Okay? But the question is, have your desires changed to where now instead of looking to do wrong, you look to do right? Have the, t- have the changes been significant enough now to whether you look to glorify God instead of trying to dishonor God? That, that's genuine repentance. That's when you know there's been a life-changing, life-changing change. <laughs> How's that? Th- that's when you know the belief has been enough that changed your life. That's repentance, okay? I was wanting to do these things. Now I want to do these things. I was headed this direction. Now I want to head this direction. That's repentance. Paul said in Acts 20, 21, I keep nothing back, I kept nothing back that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, repentance must always be part of the message. It must always be part of the message. If it's not, then you'll end up getting a church of unregenerated people whose lives are just as messed up as they were always were before, accomplishing nothing but good music and lots of fun social activities to help people uh, uh, feel better about themselves and they'll make lots of friends. But Jesus always preached repentance. It is part of the core message. It must be part of our core message in everything we preach. There must be repentance. If there's never been repentance, if you just say, well, my life's always kind of been this way. It's just kind of always the way I've been. I don't really see any drastic changes. I don't see much changes in my desires. I just kind of want to, you know, just kind of coasting along, doing my thing. Do what everybody else does. Make sure I've got lots of friends. I've got a happy family. That's not repentance. And listen, even young kids can understand repentance. Even young kids who put their faith and trust in Christ at a young can understand repentance. It's not that complicated. Okay. A lot of preachers today would argue, well, we know in our church we just preach a message of hope. We don't want to preach a message of fear. And the tragedy behind that, folks, is they're only half right. We should preach a message of hope. I have no problem preaching a message of hope. But men and women and teenagers and kids must all also recognize that they are sinners in need of repentance. Unless sin is acknowledged and confessed, there is no hope. I was at a conference uh, uh, this past Friday morning, 
And uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm involved in a very interesting group of people at my work uh, where 50 to 75 to 100 people will get together once a month and talk about grief and loss. Uh, in fact, it was kind of funny because one of the men, we, we go around and we introduce ourselves, and one of the gentlemen said, uh, I, before he introduced himself, and everybody who knew, knew who he was anyway, he's one of the most recognized speakers in our area on the subject, and he, he said, be, he said uh, before, I, before I pass the mic, he said, I want you all to know if you haven't seen the movie, and he, he mentioned a particular movie, he said, if you haven't seen that movie, you ought to see it. It's really great. It's got a lot of really good grief issues in it. And then he passed the microphone, and I turned to the people beside me, and I said, we're a strange group, you know, aren't we? You know, here's a good movie about grief and loss. Let's all go watch it, okay? You know, most people are talking about, have you seen Transformers? Okay, you know, and, uh, but we're talking about good grief and loss movies, okay? It's just a little bit odd. But the speaker at our, in fact, it's called the Grief Support Network, okay? And uh, the speaker made a very profound statement. He said basically this, and I probably won't quote him exactly, but he said, no one can change what they don't recognize, no one can change what they first don't recognize. And this was a lost man. He wasn't a Christian man. and He may have been a Christian, I don't know, but he wasn't speaking from a Christian perspective. But his point was, listen, if you don't know that you have something wrong with you, you're not going to change it. You can't and you won't. Until we acknowledge sin, we will never understand the importance of doing something about our sin. You ever heard somebody say it's harder to get that person lost than it is to get them saved? You ever heard that? You know, what do we mean by that? it's harder to get them to acknowledge that they're a sinner, that they have a sin problem, a sin need, than it is. And once they recognize that, then we might get them saved, but they won't recognize that they're a sinner. And, and it must be recognized. That's why Jesus said, now is the time to believe. Now is the time to repent. And I'm pretty convinced that if Jesus were to start his public ministry today and go into our schools, and go into our government, go into our places of business, walk down our city streets, come into some of our homes, I think he would still preach the message of repentance. And he would say, there's just some things here. There needs to be a turning. There needs to be a changing. You say you believe, but boy, I'm just not seeing it over here. You say you you believe the gospel, the life-changing power of Christ, but I'm not seeing the life change. The message in most churches today is what? Come as you are and stay as you are. God loves you just as you are. You know, we have sung, you know, come or uh, just as I am until we've sung it in the ground. Everybody believes it. Well, just as I am, Jesus loves me and he just, he's stuck with what he gets. And that is not the gospel message of all. What did God tell the the woman caught in adultery? He said, he, he, he forgave her, yes. He loved her, yes. But then he said what? He said, go and go right back to your adultery, right? Is that what he said? Go and keep messing around. Go and just do what you've always done. We still love you. Is that what he preached? No. He said, go and sin no more. He said, stop it. Cut it out. Your life needs to be changed. And from every indication of Scripture, it was. Third part of his message, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but third part of the message was the kingdom. He said in verse 14, Now after John, not Jesus, John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now what is the preaching of the kingdom of God? Okay. The preaching of the kingdom of God was basically this. Had the Jews received Christ as their Messiah, the kingdom would have come. The kingdom could have been established. Uh, There would have been no church age, but God knew that. Christ knew that when He came, He would be rejected. Okay, The Gentiles would also be part of the kingdom. uh, But had they believed and had they repented, Jesus could have established His millennial kingdom at that time. But what happened when Jesus preached? People didn't like His preaching, did they? Kind of like they don't like our preaching today. Okay? They didn't like that preaching. Because he preached about this life changed. He, pre- he preached about a, a, a belief that would change our lives. And the people didn't like it. Let's go on to, I want you all to see not only the heart of Jesus' preaching, but the radical effects of Jesus' preaching. When Jesus preached, it had a radical effect on the people. Look at verse 16 through 20. It says, As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. 
Jesus is walking along the shores of Galilee, and he sees Simon and his brother Andrew. Uh, they're casting. They would take the big round nets, and they would just cast them off the side of the boat and let them drift, settle a little bit, and then they would pull in the nets and, and hopefully reel in some fish. And Jesus calls them to follow him, and he tells them, If you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And, you know, you would have thought just reading this story that maybe one turned to the other and said, You know, I think we ought to go. I don't know. What are we going to do with this boat? What are we going to do with these nets? Uh, what are we, you know, I don't know. You think we ought to go? What do you think? I don't know, Simon. We're brothers. Let's talk this over. No indication that any of that took place. The Bible says, in fact, it uses a very specific word. They immediately left their nets and they followed him. There must have been something about him, his persona. Uh, they had heard him preach, I'm sure, before. The Bible says that many people came to hear him preach. I think they'd probably heard him. They had seen him. They recognized him. They knew there was something different about this guy. And when he said, come follow me, they said, that sounds like a good idea. And they threw down their nets and they went. Notice that he, he gives them a better proposition. He says, if you'll follow me, I will make you fishers of men. You see, folks, life with Christ is always better than we can ever imagine. I want you to think about what the life of these guys must have been like before they met Christ. Okay, we're talking Simon and Andrew. Okay, Simon, who became Simon Peter. Okay, can you think about what their life must have been like? Every day, they get up, they gather their nets, they go down to the shore, they push out on their little boat. They spend a day throwing their nets over the side of the boat, hoping to reel in some fish. Some days are better than others. They probably talk about the same things they've always talked about, probably obviously talk about some fishing, you know, as other boats would go by. How's the fishing today? Ah, oh, not too bad. What are you using? Nets. Okay. You know, well, you know, it's not like they were fishing for trout or anything. You know, they probably talked about the local gossip. Hey, did you hear about those other fishermen, yeah, got that hole in the boat. Mm, bad news, they're out of commission for a while. Maybe some politics from, from time to time. Who won the games down at the local arena? You know, their life consisted pretty much of living their entire life in Galilee probably and then dying and going to the grave. And to be completely honest, they had very little to live for. But Jesus said, I can give you something a whole lot better. When they obeyed the voice of Christ, He gave them things that they could never, ever imagine. And He can do the same thing for you. Can I suggest to you some ways God changes our life after we follow Him? Listen to these three things. First of all, your life becomes immensely expanded. Your life becomes immensely expanded. For these men, obeying Christ drastically changed their life. Peter would one day go to Rome. I bet Peter thought he would never go to Rome. But one day, Peter went to Rome. John became the pastor in Ephesus. If you had asked John what he had planned for his life, he probably would have said, well, I don't plan on ever pastoring or preaching in a church. They didn't know what churches were. James became the first pastor of the church in Jerusalem. History tells us that Andrew went as far as the borders of modern-day Russia preaching the gospel. You see, before they had these little minds and they lived in these little worlds, they, they had small interests that now overflowed into the fact that where they became theologians, uh, they became thinkers, they became preachers, they became strategists, all because they obeyed and followed Jesus. Um, not to bore you with my own testimony, but uh, I have been places and done things that I never thought I would ever do in my life. But out of simple obedience to Christ and following His leading in my life, I've gone places I never thought I would go, and I've done things I thought I would never do, and I've been in, I've been in states and countries I never thought I would be in. I've been in mission trips to Korea uh, and to Mexico, deep into Mexico, by the way. Uh, I never thought I would live in Southern California. I, I was a city boy from, from the heart of the Midwest. Why would I go to California? And on a lark, went to, to just visit my brother for six weeks and ended up staying there 12 years uh, and enjoyed every minute of it and, and uh, gained a...